And now we have Quillfish. Players of gold, silver, and crystal will remember the fisherman wielding one fondly, as the spiky pinball was such a departure from the Goldeen and Magikarp they usually spammed. Also, there is no way any Pokemon fan who watched Breaking Bad didn't think of Quillfish when Walt described the Blowfish's size-expanding intimidation tactic to Jesse. Today, we're going to see if Quillfish really was a threat in the competitive scene, or if it was just full of air. And so, we ask, how good was Quillfish actually? And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. Despite having access to the coveted spikes, Quillfish wasn't able to establish a niche in its debut generation of OU. Some players theorized it as useful thanks to its fighting resistance, as opposed to Cloyster's fighting weakness, which GSC teams tend to stack thanks to the obligatory Snorlax as well as other staples in Steelix and Tyranitar, and Quillfish's toxic immunity and Giga Dream neutrality was nice as well, as it allowed Quillfish to not be threatened by Fortress. However, Cloyster was the staple for a reason. Cloyster had enormous physical bulk that allowed it to switch in on Snorlax all day long, even being able to take a boosted cross chop from a champ and the choice of an amazing move in Explosion or Rapid Spin. Quillfish couldn't even handle Machamp because so many of them ran Earthquake. Anyway, since Quillfish couldn't hack it in OU, Quillfish dropped to UU, and there it became a staple as it was the tier's only good spiker. It had used beyond that, but it was mostly about getting the spikes down. Spikes was an incredible move even with just one layer, especially since GSC UU was quite low on rapid spinners. Even Blastoise wasn't that common. That said, its other uses were useful. It outsped Tear Queen, Needle Queen, and dealt a ton of damage with Hydro Pump, which was useful in knocking her down into range for teammates like Electabuzz and Scyther. Its secondary stab, Sludge Bomb, came with an irritating 30% poison rate that forced premature rests from the Metagame's resident sleep talkers, the Slow Twins, and Hypno. The last move was up for grabs. Usually it was Haze, which was nice for resetting boosts of something like Curse Granville, Swords Dance Kabutops or Victory Bell, and Belly Drum or Growth Politoed. Thanks to Quillfish's good speed, it could get crucial chip damage off on them as well, once again fulfilling its main purpose of making things easier for its teammates. It also had solid bulk, allowing it to take a hit or two. Some players even allowed it to take an occasional stab psychic, which it would survive by the skin of its teeth just to get a layer of spikes down, although it was usually more useful to preserve Quillfish's health so that it could actually check the rest of the metagame. However, it wasn't always beholden into running Haze. Curse was a viable option for the last move, as it allowed it to defeat Rapid Spin Blastoise one-on-one, -on -one, and thus keep spikes up. Whereas otherwise it would be permanently walled and without spikes, without being paired with Haunter. Quillfish was useful on all sorts of teams. Offense, balance, stall, they all appreciated spikes and its ability to pseudo-check a swath of the metagame's biggest threats. Spikes was pretty much the only reason Quillfish got used, which speaks to how powerful a move it is, but Quillfish wasn't going to complain about that. It got the lair down and check some threats well, and that was just fine, as that simple little role established it as one of GSC UU's best, most important Pokemon. Quillfish got some excellent boosts in the third generation, and while it wasn't enough for it to break into OU, it got self-destruct, allowing it to pose a serious offensive threat on its own in UU. Ghost types were rare, and rocks didn't want to eat Quillfish's stab hydro pump, so Quillfish was often going to be able to blow up on a neutral target. Thanks to its solid 95 base attack, any neutral target was almost certainly taking huge damage, if not getting outright KO'd by the boom. Self-destruct was also useful to prevent Blastoise from spinning, and to heavily damage damage it at the same time. Quillfish also loved that spikes now went up to three layers. This allowed it to support its offensive teammates by indirectly powering up their moves via chip damage before taking something down with it, making it an excellent choice on fast-paced offensive teams. Quillfish did also get Swords Dance, but that was better done by one of the UU metagame's best Pokemon, fellow water poison type Tentacruel. However, that wasn't a problem. Quillfish was an offensive spiker first and foremost. Incidentally, it was actually walled hard by Tentacruel, who couldn't be poisoned by Sludge Bomb and could rapid spin all day without fearing Quillfish's poison point either. But Tentacruel also was a major threat with Source Dance, so Quillfish getting to blow up on it was still a very good thing. Now it was no longer the only spiker around, so it wasn't a near automatic addition to most teams like in the previous generation. But it was still an excellent choice and even came with the benefit of allowing its teammate Amistar to run a sweeping rain dance set instead of acting as its team spiker as it so often did and passing up on its devastating offensive potential. Overall, Quillfish was once again a fairly simple Pokemon, but this time around it posed much more of a threat thanks to Self-Destruct, allowing it to be more than just a spikes machine, although getting up multiple layers was incredibly useful as well. As a result, it was an important, terrific Pokemon in advanced UU.
Generation 4 brought a bevy of boosts for Quillfish, and while they wouldn't be enough to break into OU again, it became a truly excellent UU Pokemon once again. The new physical special split meant it could finally use Water Staff from its superior physical attack stat. This, alongside its Swift Swim ability, made it a terrific sweeper on Rain Dance teams. Its booming capabilities received a buff as well. It no longer had to settle for self-destruct upon gaining access to the more powerful Explosion. It even got Aqua Jet for some nice stab priority. Coolfish's boosts weren't purely offensive though. It also received several excellent utility tools. Taunt was useful for preventing recovery and hazards from the bulky walls on stall teams. It also gained a second entry hazard in the devastating new Toxic Spikes. But with that said, in Yu Yu, its spiking sets usually didn't bother with Toxic Spikes, since Venusaur was so common. However, since Yu Yu had some excellent other spikers, Coolfish was often relegated to being one of a rain team's cascade of sweepers. Not that there was anything wrong with that of course. It fulfilled an important role on those teams. Its Swords Dance boosted Stab Poison Jab meant that unlike its fellow physical rain abuser, Kabutops, it couldn't be checked by bulky pure grass types, Tangrowth, and Leafeon, while its explosion nigh guaranteeing to take an opposing Pokemon out was invaluable. Ghosts, Rocks, and Steels wouldn't want to take a rain boosted Stab Waterfall, meaning that Quillfish's boom would hit and thus KO a neutral target. This was so crucial because the quick, immediate nature of the KO meant the opponent opposing team would have less Pokemon to dance around the assault from Quillfish's remaining teammates. However, as time went on and the metagame shifted, Quillfish showed itself to be an exceptional utility Pokemon as well. After Frostlass's ban, players looked for a Pokemon to replace it, and Quillfish rose to the occasion, both as a suicide lead and a bulky mid-game set. Yes, something as frail as Frostlass ran a bulky set. Please refer to how good was Frostlass actually for more information. Anyway, Quillfish had solid speed for the tier and taunt, making it a great lead. It was easily able to set spikes up at the beginning of the game while shutting down slower stealth rockers. And while it didn't pack the built-in spin blocking for Frostlass's ghost typing, it threatened every spinner with explosion, whose double down potential was also reminiscent of Frostlass's destiny bond. As for the bulky set, Heart Gold and Soul Silver gifted Quillfish Pain Split, which severely irritated Stall alongside Taunt and allowed it to stay healthy so it could repeatedly switch into common Pokemon like Milotic, Arcanine, and Blaziken and spike all over them. It even punished contact moves, most notably U-Turn, with Poison Point. Overall, in both offense and utility roles, Quillfish was an excellent, thoroughly important Pokemon in Gen 4 UU. Before we move on, however, we must mention that Quillfish had small roles in OU and even Ubers. It was strictly limited to rain teams in OU, and not even every rain team, but its ability to absorb toxic spikes for its fellow rain abusers, namely Kingdra, was invaluable, as was its powerful explosion. In Ubers, it was able to use a combination of Payback and Aqua Jet to limit Deoxys' speed, the metagame's definitive lead, to one layer of hazards while maintaining its Focus Sash to then get spikes up. Taunt allowed it to prevent Stealth Rock from bulkier sets like Groudon and Dialga, so it was a small niche, but it was effective. Quillfish was one of the many Swift Swimmers terrorizing teams at the beginning of the 5th generation, before the ability was banned in conjunction with Politoed's Drizzle. While it wasn't as notorious as the big three of Kingdra, Kabutops, and Ludicolo, and it disliked Gen 5's explosion nerf, it was still useful, being able to absorb the toxic spikes that would otherwise ruin its teammates, while being another source of fast, powerful water stab to pile on the opponent. Once the Drizzle Swim ban, as it was known, took effect, Quillfish dropped out of OU. Now, while it didn't last in UU, that didn't necessarily mean it wasn't used in it, or that it wasn't good in it. Quite the opposite, in fact. It did drop to RU by usage, but certainly not because it wasn't good. It was excellent. Quillfish was able to check both types that UU was famous for having, a litany of offensive monsters in fire and fighting. Despite the massive power of the attacks that were being thrown around, such as Darmanitan's Flare Blitz and Heracross's Close Combat, Quillfish was able to stave them off easily, thanks to an amazing new tool it received received from the dream world. Intimidate. With Rocky Helmet, it even made them take damage just for attacking. This was incredibly useful for punishing the otherwise risk-free U-turn. That said, Black Sludge's recovery was also highly useful, especially since it meant Quillfish wasn't entirely reliant on Pain Split to heal. Fire and fighting types were known for being incredibly hard to check, and having a Pokemon that countered both while setting up spikes was just amazing. Quillfish's bulky set was the main one in use, but the Suicide set was excellent as well. It separated itself from 
from its competition with Taunt, as well as the newly gained Destiny Bond, which Taunt went hand in hand with, and served to make up for its nerfed explosion, though explosion could still be nice to block a rapid spin. Quillfish's limited usage in UU was honestly a little baffling, considering how effective it was, but RU wasn't complaining, as they loved having Quillfish around. It was one of the metagame's best Pokemon. It used the exact same bulky set and played the same way as in UU, but instead of checking Darmanitan, it now checked Entei and Embor, as well as other top tier physical attackers like Durant and Escavalier. RU was more spin heavy than UU, but that wasn't a problem, as Quillfish didn't fear Kabutops or Cryogonal at all, crippling them hard with Thunder Wave. Not only that, it set up all over defensive teams, as it absolutely dominated the ever-present Alomomola. It was pretty much UU Quillfish Xeroxed over to RU, just with different surroundings, and it was absolutely excellent. One of the tier's most defining Pokemon. So chalk up a fourth successful generation for Quillfish in a row. Defog was a real annoyance for Quillfish in Generation 6. That, in conjunction with it being a little too frail for the tier, and that spikes weren't that valuable in it, meant Quillfish was niche at best in UU, and not really worth using. In RU, it wasn't bad, but had the issue of strong competition in Garbodor, who performed similarly. Garbodor had both spikes and toxic spikes while absorbing toxic spikes, and it punished contact moves like Sock's close combat with Rocky Helmet. While it lacked Quillfish's Intimidate, it had higher HP defense and especially special defense and most importantly it resisted grass meaning that unlike quillfish it was an excellent check to the dangerous virizion as well as crucially being helpful against venusaur these two as cornerstones of the metagame were a lot more relevant and difficult to handle than fighting types like embor who was the main pokemon quillfish check not being chased out by electrics like rotomo and jolteon was another notable point in garbodor's favor garbodor was also able to pile on more residual damage even when it fainted, thanks to Aftermath and its parting gift of 25% to any contact move that KO'd it. Quillfish did have a few advantages. It could spread status with Scald or Thunder Wave, it could stop the fog attempts from Golbat with Taunt, and Destiny Bond could potentially take an opposing Pokemon with it, or at least make the opponent play carefully if they didn't want to fall into that trap. It definitely wasn't a bad Pokemon at all, and it got the job done. However, its lower bulk, typing that's less favorable to checking the metagame's topmost threats, and lack of the incredible punishing aftermath meant that Garbodor outshined it in most cases. That said, as far as being outclassed, it could be a lot worse. Quillfish still had a decent niche in RU that could lead to success if used by a knowledgeable trainer who could fully utilize its advantages over literal trash. Gen 7's power creep knocked Quillfish down several pegs, skipping NU and landing in PU. But this turned out to be a blessing in disguise, as there was no more Garbodor to compete with. Quillfish established itself as an excellent Pokemon in the tier. It checked many common top tier threats with its typing and intimidate. This gave it plenty of opportunity to switch in and throw down the ever useful spikes, wearing the opponent down without actually having to use attacking moves. In fact, thanks to Rocky Helmet, it was able to wear down the opponent without using any moves at all, just switching into one of the many contact moves it resisted, such as U-turn and fighting attacks, would do the trick. In addition to being a great switch in to non-primate fighting types, since primate's defiant ability would result in an attack boost as opposed to a drop, such as Girder, Combuskin, Crabomable, and Hitmonchan, Quillfish was able to check pretty much any physical attacker in a pinch, even without resisting their attacks. Mostly applicable to the tier's standout normal types, Kangaskhan, Stoutland, and Dodrio, but also various other threats like Lycanroc, Leafeon and Alolan Sandslash. Or at least Quillfish would help its teammates dance around them, thanks to Intimidate weakening them and Rocky Helmet chipping them. Quillfish wasn't just a way to check offense though. With Taunt, it seriously messed with the tier's slower defensive staples, as it notably prevented Skunk Tank from defogging and Regirock from stealth rocking, among other things. As always, Destiny Bond was useful, especially with its ability to dissuade Electros from coming in and spam its ever irritating Volt Switch. Though Stab Poison Jab was nice to expand the amount of of Pokemon Quillfish could check, such as Obama Snow and the Spikes Immune, Magic Guard, Eviolite, Light, Clefairy. However, that's not all. While it wasn't too common, for the first time in generations, Quillfish busted out Swift Swim, able to function as a dangerous sweeper on the occasional rain offense team. It even had the choice of an upgraded Water Stab, as the tried and true Waterfall's 20% flinch rate could be crucial in allowing it to break past a Pokemon that would otherwise KO at first. But the new Liquidation was stronger and could lash out with a nasty 
nasty defense drop that made Quillfish even more difficult to switch into. Both moves could be powered up even further by Waterium Z, which led a Hydro Vortex of stupendously stunning strength and rain. If Quillfish managed to grab a Swords Dance, as it was so often able to against defensive staples like Audino and Clefairy, good night. Spikes were Quillfish's claim to fame, but Quillfish was a crucial part of making rain teams as threatening as they were. Overall, Sun and Moon PU Quillfish was absolutely terrific and one of the metagame's most important Pokemon. And now in Generation 8 so far, Quillfish has found itself as a spiking machine once again. It's not RU, but it has a nice niche in the tier, with its usual Intimidate Rocky Helmet antics being excellent to switch in on, check, and spike against some of the metagame's most dangerous physical attackers, such as Beware, Scrafty, Snorlax, and Braviary, preventing them from setting up with Taunt and forcing them to attack, which incurs Rocky Helmet Chip and makes them unable to shrug off damage from Liquidation with recovery moves. Since they were forced to attack, that would also mean eventually Quillfish would be in KO range of the next attack, allowing Quillfish to take them down with it through Destiny Blood. Quillfish was a great choice on fast-paced offensive teams that appreciate the heavy amount of chip damage it forces on the opponent in a short amount of time. That said, its usage has landed it in NU, and unfortunately, hey better late than never, both Frostlass and Garbodor, its most serious forms of competition, are both in the tier and both seem better acclimatized to it. Now we'll have to wait and see how Quillfish responds, but it might very well fall to PU, but at least there it will probably dominate. And that's it, so how good was Quillfish actually? Well, let's be honest, it would be a lot, lot worse without spikes. However, since it does have spikes, it was able to use its unique defensive profile to use one of the best moves in the game and become one of the most used lower tier Pokemon of all time. Switching is the foundation of competitive singles Pokemon, and punishing the opponent for switching is thus a really big deal. It's had spots of swift swim abuse in the past, but by and large, Quillfish was a spiking machine, and a seriously good one at that. It's started with four straight spots of seriously solid spiking from its debut in Generation 2 throughout Generation 5. It even had a rough patch in Gen 6's RU, where its inability to handle grass types meant it had strong competition from Garbodor, but in Generation 7's PU, it returned to form. It's been continuing this success in Generation 8's lower tiers, because seriously, who doesn't like spikes? It might fall further, but wherever it lands, it will spike all over the place. Also, no, there was no notable usage for Quillfish found in VGC. Thanks for watching everyone, and as always, if you liked the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False White Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content, and in the comments, I want to know, what do you think about competitive Quillfish? How would you improve it over Garbodor or Frostlass, for example? Whatever it is, let me know in the comments. Also, thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos, and thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.